is out protesting. So is Germany and Quebec. So I'll show you all of that. There's so much going on. There's lots to get to. Let's get to it first. We have to start with housing. Cloward Piven's strategy overwhelmed the system to collapse its strategy. What's going on? It's happening all across the West from Germany to UK, to Canada, and the United States, et cetera. Different ways to get to the same thing. In Germany, they're importing people saying, we have to help all of these poor people. In the United States, they don't import people because they don't want to help anybody. They just open up the southern border and make that a bone of contention. In Canada, we open up our the floodgates to temporary foreign workers, to temporary students, et cetera, et cetera, and play the refugee card a little bit. But that's like 150,000 people uh, compared to 900,000 students and uh, what, 600,000 temporary foreign workers. The the numbers start to add up quick. And why is that important? Because they're trying to overwhelm the system. Why? So they can collapse it. Why? So they can bring in their new system and claim that, see, the old system didn't work and the new system will work. We'll just build this plane on the way down. Like jump out of this plane. No, you don't need a parachute. Of course you don't need a parachute. We're going to build the new plane on the way down with the new th the new things that will work to, you know, to, to deal with all of these influx of people. The new plane won't have any amenities. We, you won't have a toilet. I doubt it'll land, right? Um, unless by land, you mean come crashing to the ground. Um, the new plane won't have anything, right? That means you don't get healthcare. You don't get education. You don't get anything, but new neighbors, you get new neighbors and they've got machetes, but you don't get a gun because uh, your skin's a little light, right? This is the plan, it seems. So we'll go through it. Here's Holger, and he says, good morning from Germany, where the housing crisis continues. In January, the construction of 16,800 dwellings was approved, the lowest level since 2012, a 23.5 reduction, a 23.5%, excuse me, reduction year over year compared to 22. The number of building permits even fell by 43%. So when Germany starts bringing in a huge amount of people who need housing desperately. Where are we going to live, Germany? We need to be saved by your, I don't know, niceness and all the rest. Um, Germany turns off production of houses or building of houses. Same thing's happening in Canada, right? We have a housing crisis because the number of starts are lower than what we were doing in the 1970s, right? But we're bringing in more people than we've ever brought in before. Why is housing so expensive? Oh goodness, I just don't know. Tess is talking about the UK and Ireland. She says this literally doubles the pop, or that's literally the double, double the population of Ireland. We are sitting idly by as our, our minority status in England comes closer. 3.35 million immigrants arrived in three years, yet we do nothing, right? This is published March 18th. Migrant surge drives London population to new record. So can you imagine how, like I watch television, and historical things about the queen and king and, and you know, making England and, and the, the different wars between, uh, I don't know if there was a war between Ireland, but the Scottish, you know, Scotland and all the rest of it. Braveheart, largely fictional, right? Um, but there, it seems like, I feel like, from Robin Hood to Braveheart, all of the fiction included, the king of England wouldn't allow everybody in Ireland to just move into the capital of London, like of, of England. They wouldn't be able to move into London. So it seems strange that now the population of Ireland is being wholesale brought in and moving into London and people are saying, you know, this seems bad. It seems bad. So that seems weird, right? And, and maybe strange to reference historical drama. I'm just saying that everything in my being, all of the media, all of the things I've been raised on leads me to believe that the population and the people who ruled that place historically wouldn't tolerate this. And so why are we? Why, why are we so different than those people? Why are we tolerating this? Why, why are we allowing? Why are we saying we don't know how to stop the politicians from doing this? Say you damn well stop or we're going to throw you out by your ankles. Holy smokeronies, right? <laughs> like they have to listen to us at some point or maybe we have to stop pay giving them money to redistribute in this way. This is London concerned Canadian says, is Canada next? And um, I support immigration, he says. I don't. I'm a child of immigrants. And what's happening right now is an invasion. I do not support what's happening right now. Holy smoke. It can't even be called immigration. It is an, an invasion, full scale. And it is violent. And it is aggressive. And we, as the population that currently is running the country, are not allowed to express our displeasure or they will shut us down for hate speech, or they will put us in jail for violence. Honestly, this is what's going on in London. <laughs> ah, pip pip cheerio, chap, right, right-o. Hmm. Uh, where's Hugh Grant? 
Right. Uh, the Clored Piven strategy, a political gambit designed to overwhelm the American government by placing so many demands on the bureaucratic structure that it collapses. Clored Piven is being applied to Western society and it's and everybody and their dog is being used to displace Americans or Westerners from Islam in Europe to South Americans in the Southern states and anywhere they can get their hands on uh, India and Canada, right? People are being weaponized their money is being used to uh, advertise, move to the West. Look how wonderful London is. Look how look how Islamic it is. You know, look come come and sing your songs. Be religious in downtown. Right, like this is a show of force. This is a show of conquest. Make no mistake. Right? Would you tolerate this? Would how how could you tolerate this? Right. So let's bring it into Canada a little bit. Bill Tuff says healthcare has collapsed in Canada. Last year, 2.2 million mass immigrants arrived uh, based on 2022 number of hospitals at 29,000 population base per hospital. Canada need, needed 75 hospitals to maintain 2023 status quo. Canada built two hospitals in 2023. Canada. Canada. <laughs> Good job, Canada. Right? So we're falling behind. Our system is being overwhelmed. And they're going to say, listen, your system doesn't work because of climate change or racism or climate changey racism, whatever it is, there's a reason your system doesn't work. And mainly that system is your skin color. Like they're going to come up with that. They're going to say that. They're going to imply that heavily. And then they're going to say, we can fix this. All you have to do is move into a tent city and give us your house. And that'll be the solution. And then we're supposed to just not question it. Right, just like we were supposed to not question the masks, just like we were not supposed to question the uh, invasion that we're enduring, just like we're not supposed to question the cost of living crisis that is being exacerbated by the tax that's going up on on April first, just like we're not supposed to question the raise that all of our politicians are getting on April first, just like we're not supposed to question any of that. We're just supposed to hand over our entire lives to the government, and they'll fix it for us. We may not like it but they'll fix it for us. Here's Dan McTeague. He says he's responding to Seamus O'Regan. O'Regan is targeting Polyev. And he says, housing is the name of the game right now. And Pierre wants Canada to fold. He wants out. He wants you to go it alone. Pierre doesn't care. I thought he cared about becoming prime minister. Huh, so weird, right? And Dan says, thanks to your government's inflation on building materials, handouts to bums who don't want to work, bureaucrats who've held back permits, and their city councillors who find every even cuter or ever cuter ways of delaying housing, your government alone accounts for a mess that Pierre Polyev will have to clean up. So Dan McTeague likes Pierre Polyev and he's on board for that. Again, we're getting played. We're getting played. Nick Leaf says, international students come to Canada on an education visa, then apply for asylum and end up staying and collecting benefits as a refugee. Trudeau accept, acted surprised or acts surprised like he doesn't know that he's buying liberal votes at any cost. Any cost. Any cost. This is outside the King Edward Hotel. Listen and see if you can see or see if you can hear the similarities to how London is. is. Madame. So these are the pro-Palestinian protesters, but also there's uh, Agenda 21, Great Reset, and um, anti-vax protesters as well here. And they're all kind of being kettled by a huge number of police. Huge number of police. Look at that. So overwhelmed for things, issues that have nothing to do with Canada, really. Um, and what's happening in the employment sector? Well, you saw that video the other day of the people trying to get a job in Mississauga at the LCBO, right? Uh, ER doc says, I've heard from several friends now, it's hard to find a job in Ontario. Some have sent over 70 job applications, no luck. They're being replaced by international students for very low wages. This is crazy. How can we let down Canadians and hire non-citizens? It's happening every day, like every single day, every single day. And I'm, I told a story, um, of people in Walmart uh, interacting with customers in English-ish and interacting with coworkers in a different language that customers don't speak. And it used to be that was verboten. Like I'd, I'd seen managers reprimand workers for doing that previously, 20, like 2020, 2019, 2020. And fast forward to 23, 24, and people are having full-blown conversations, yelling across the store in different languages. And again, it's jarring. It's strange. Is, is it intolerant to say, like, 
these changes are too fast. These changes are too much. We are being overwhelmed. Why? I know why the government doesn't do anything because the government's orchestrating the, the Clover Piven strategy. <laughs> Liberal Party puts this out and they're heavily ratioed 915 likes to two and a half thousand replies. I think the, the likes are manufactured. Twitter's a nightmare. It's an absolute dumpster fire. Anyway, the Liberal government says, our Liberal plan is building a strong middle class and an economy that works for everyone today and for generations to come. It doesn't work today. It's not going to work for generations to come. These idiots have destroyed things and they damn well know it. Robert Burns says, really, these new homes are, for, are mostly for third world immigrants from barbaric countries for cheap labor and demographic change. Canada has the highest immigration in the world, over a million a year or about 5,000 a day, unheard of in any other country in the world. Canadians are paid slave wages and you cannot live on. Canada has 6 million without a doctor, 2.8 million without a job, hundreds dying every month with no surgery, 10 and 20 hour wait times in ERs and patients in hallways or sitting in ambulances and dying. Canada has at least 250,000 homeless. We have 2 million visiting food banks and growing and that's growing all while our politicians are living the good life get the best of care do not wait in line and go to private clinics we are first in line for surgery they're first in line for surgery compared to australia where the minimum wage is 24 dollars an hour and they get 10 days of sick pay per month see now this stuff i don't want to compare to australia because australia um they have different they have a different economy etc 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 um I don't want anybody saying, well, we'll give you 10 days of vacation a month and we'll raise the we'll raise the minimum wage to $24 an hour. That's the last thing I want. Like that is not an argument that's going to fix this problem. Let's abolish the minimum wage, abolish the taxes and make it business friendly and holy smoke, we'll see some changes. Like <laughs> abolish all of the taxes and make the government wage $1,000 a year. You want to be an MP? You better be self-made and you better know what you're doing, right? Like these people look at this like a job. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous ridiculous. Olia says, well, they look at it like a job or like infiltration. They look at it, the people who look at it like a job are looking at it like I'm applying for a job and I'm going to, you know, go on a job interview and that's going to be the, the campaign. And the other people who look at it like a job are um, military assets, intelligence assets, and they are being placed by their bosses and they go in and they draw the paycheck to harm the country. Fundamentally, it should be a very small government, 10, 12 people, maybe to to manage immigration and some very small core files. And other than that, nothing else. And the money that should be going through payroll and the, and the upper echelon of government, very small, very small, because they shouldn't need it. It shouldn't need it. Holy smoke. Trump didn't take a salary. Olia is talking about this tiny house. So these people are trying to solve their problem. And the BC government says, oh, oh, no. No, you can't do that. Here you go. Appear to be living the tiny home. Oh, sorry, sorry. Too fast. I was so, I was doing so well. I was doing so well. Here you go. They designed this tiny home themselves, nestled yeah. in their forested property near Peachland. Kitchen, um, fridge, nice live edge uh, tables that I milled up myself. For five years, the couple and their dogs lived a peaceful and sustainable life here until the day they found a stop work order posted on their front door. So I called. Then the peace ended. <laughs> Called up the regional Just district kidding. and said, hey, what's this all about? Um, I'm not building. I've been living here for years. And the bylaw officer informed me that that's not allowed. And yeah, I have to comply immediately. The issue, the district says the home doesn't meet building code, safety standards, or land use designations. And health officials classify their grey water discharge as domestic sewage. Now, the district has ordered King to remove the tiny home by the end of next month or face a $1,000 fine and legal action. I definitely don't agree with it. It's like I've said before, I'm doing no harm to anyone around me. I don't think this is an environmental hazard. I think this is a very sustainable and reasonable, reasonable way to live. Not according to the district, however, which has issue with the way the tiny home was built. They certainly need... Uh, permits. They need to follow the BC Building Code and they need to be done in a way that's uh, safe for people and also for the environment. So do you think that this home isn't safe for him and his wife? Uh, Brady, I think that that's something that our staff have been working with. Dodge. Absolute dodge. If I was these people, I would identify as refugees. There you go. <laughs> that's it. I would donate the tiny home to refugees, like maybe have the wife identify as a refugee and then you know, do whatever paperwork, it can be bullshit paperwork, and then have the husband donate the, to the refugee wife. 
and then bam, protected, right? Because obviously we're refugees. We can't, we can't go anywhere else. That's it. We don't have a thousand dollars. We'll see if the government will cover it. Chris says, remember when an MP tried to raise concerns about the WEF infiltration in our government and the Speaker of the House shut him down? The whole thing is so worth listening to because yeah, there's a little bit, it's a little bit crackly at the beginning, but you can absolutely hear what the member is saying. And the Speaker of the House at the end does such a bull, it's a garbage transition. It's like Doug Ford trying to be suave. It's crazy. Here we go. Kestiani Kalantek, questions and comments. Uh, the Honorable Member for Oshawa. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I listened to my colleague's speech. I had a constituent that wanted me to ask a question about outside interference to our democracy. Klaus Schwab is the head of the World Economic Forum, and he bragged how his subversive WWF World Economic Forum has, quoted, infiltrated governments around the world. He said that his organization had penetrated more than half of Canada's cabinet. And I was wondering, in the interest of transparency, could the member please name which cabinet ministers are on board with the WEF's agenda? My concern is the deputy. Uh, order, order, order. I, I know he was. I know the, uh, the member was in a, a really good, good question there, but the, the the audio is really, really bad, and the video is really, really bad as well. Um, and I and I and I apologize. I don't know if if the member. Okay, uh, let's let's uh, let's try again. The honorable. I don't know if the member. Mm, okay, let's try again. But he doesn't actually call back. And then somebody says, that, that member's spreading misinformation. The, the, the Honorable Member for Timmins James Bay. Mr. Speaker, that member is promoting open disinformation. That's not debate. We have to call out disinformation. Uh, we'll get into debate again. Uh, the Honorable Member, uh, questions and comments, the Honorable Member for Lambton, Kent Middlesex. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So he and moved on. He, he didn't go back to the same person who was having the audio visual question or issues and he just moved on. Oh, maybe we'll give another, okay, ha, ha, ha. So ridiculous, absolutely ridiculous. And here's the, here's the Riddler comment from, real me this, how do immigrants strengthen our country, but not their own, right? If you're doctors and nurses and electricians and plumbers and things like that, well, I, like, why are we sending trained Canadians to you know, help around the world for those things? I mean, fix it. Do, do the things in your country that you want to come and do here, right? Like strengthen your country, we'll strengthen ours. The reason we don't is because 30, 40 years ago, Canada realized we could import tax-paying citizens wholesale, fully grown. It costs a lot to have a child between zero and 18 because they, they're just a, a suck on the system, right? And so instead of growing and investing in those kids, those Canadian kids, they invested in foreigners who are already adults. Please come and pay taxes in Canada. Taxes, please. Yep, that's it. And the... The, the, act of, carry that. the act of coming to the country juices the economy and it doesn't take long. Just like a pharmaceutical company starting to um, pay for the government programs, it doesn't take long for the government program to go, this money's great. Holy, how did we even operate without this money? And same thing. It's exactly the same thing. You get addicted to the money and all of a sudden you're, not, you're no longer working for the citizens anymore. You're working for the pharmaceutical company, or in this case, you're working to bring in as many foreign people because they start paying taxes and they don't ask questions, right? Because they don't speak the language yet. Oh, they want us to change the language? Okay, fine, right? Ryan says the government that cares. So let's talk about money. So these people, the tiny home people, right? Um, they're, they're trying to solve their housing problem and so on and so forth. But a whole bunch of people listened to Justin Trudeau in 2020 and he was like, listen, the interest rates are going to be so low for so long. Look at the history of interest rates, man. You should buy a house that you can't afford because the interest, it would be irresponsible for you to buy a house that you could afford because borrowing money is so cheap, man. We're, we, this is the same thing. You get addicted to the cheap money. So it's so cheap. It would be irresponsible for you not to take advantage of that money sitting there. It's just sitting there on the table and you're leaving it. And then they bought the house. And then the interest rates went up for the first time in what, 40 years at a, at a rate unseen in 40 years. These people got absolutely destroyed because they listened to what Justin Trudeau said and the bank said. Here's, here's a video. The editing's a little hinky in it, but we're going to watch the first minute or so. Here we go. Governments are going to have to carry that debt. The servicing costs on that are going to be very high. Sorry? The, the servicing costs on the debt that you're going to have to carry, that you're, you're adding to now, right? Interest rates are at historic lows, Glenn. Uh, okay, but it's still a lot of money. No, 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 no. It's, it's still a lot yeah. of money. No, no, no. It, and, and you don't know that, where... The, okay, so, 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 but how are, how are you going to pay for that? 
How are we going to pay for those costs in, in future years? Are you going to increase taxes or are you going to uh, cut programs? Okay. Against that background, we are being unusual. Cut programs. Okay. Against that background, we are being unusually clear that interest rates are going to be low for a long time. The uh, policy rate of the Bank of Canada, which is at the effective lower bound, is currently at 0 0.25. Uh, the Conservatives keep raising fear about a potential 1% increase, which would represent a 500% a increase if it were to shoot to 1.25 overnight. In any event, the Bank of Canada, during the testimony before this committee, has explained that there is no plan to do that for the next uh, potentially few years, and that in any event, the conditions that would justify such a, a radical increase would uh, essentially tell a story that the economy economy is doing very well. They imported a lot of people. They imported more people as the pandemic went on. Like 2020, not so much, right? Um, and into 2021, it started coming back. 2022 was record-breaking. 23 was record-breaking. And 24 is on track for to be record-breaking as well. So they keep bringing people in. And I've talked about this a lot. It's juicing the economy. It's sending false signals. The false signals are in enticing, forcing the Bank of Canada to increase the rates. The economy looks like it's doing well. It's not really. The reason it looks like it's doing well is because so many people are coming and buying the products, right? If you turn that off, what happens? You're snookered, you're screwed, your economy crashes, and they know it. They know it. Well, Canadians were hit with another interest rate uppercut today uh, after inflationary deficits by this Liberal government are driving up inflation and interest rates. The governor of the Bank of Canada has even said these deficits are driving the higher costs. One mother told the CBC that she signed in to a 1.9% mortgage variable rate because she believed the government that rates would be low for long. And now she says, I punched myself on, the, uh, on that decision. Why did I listen to these people? Mr. Speaker, how is this mother going to pay the extra $1,000 a month in mortgage payments that they're putting on her back? Here, here. Right? So... It's, they're not doing this. They didn't do this by accident, in my opinion. These people didn't do this because of incompetence, as a lot of people like to claim. Um, Christia Freeland is a finance minister with no finance acumen or real training that I've understood, right? She's a journalist, as far as I understand. And so, and Justin Trudeau is a bad actor. So there's, <laughs> there's not enough experience to be sure that they know what they're doing and i'm sure they don't know what they're doing they don't have any they don't have anybody who can do the job that they've been given right um in their cabinet ryan garrettson says nine years of progressive insanity have ruined canada the ndp and the media are just as complicit they've propped up and protected these megalomaniacs for far too long uh, canada is becoming globally recognized a globally recognized lesson in what not to do from assisted suicide to housing affordability canada now cited as the very model of a worst case scenario yay <laughs> we're number one it's not good. It's not good. We could be better. We could be so much better. And it would not take much. It would take it would take it would take a lot at the beginning. But after that, right, once you get that ball rolling, man, it'll just roll downhill. Leaf says, this is the BRICS stuff and the GDP of BRICS versus the G7 countries. So the G7 is representing 26.9 trillion and BRICS is representing 19.4 trillion. One of the things yesterday as well in the YouTube comments, I don't know why I went through the YouTube comments yesterday. Sometimes I'll just open up the comments to see what the temperature is of the video, right? Um, so one of the YouTube comments was saying, stop talking about money. One of the, th like money is, money is very complicated and it has, a role to play in politics, a, a big role to play in politics. And I need to talk about money. It's, I can't not talk about money. But what I don't want is people thinking that I'm some money expert or I've got some inside track or some inside knowledge or something like that. I really don't. And, and I make that really plain. I'm talking about money as it relates to politics, kind of at the macro level. But it does come down to the, the micro level because of what we were just looking at people buying houses that they can't afford, listening to people in government who are saying things like, well, this interest rate's going to be down for a long time. I don't want a comment that I'm making to trigger somebody to think, oh, I should, I should make this financial movement. If you think that, I want you to think to yourself, I should consult somebody who knows finance and possibly think about making this financial movement. And now that might not help you if you're thinking of moving into Bitcoin, but then you should talk to a Bitcoiner and I'm not that, right? I mean, I own Bitcoin, but I'm not an expert and I don't think I would advise people on a platform like this. I'm not, I'm not 
smart enough for it. No, that's not true. I am smart enough for it, but I don't have the experience. I, I can't feel it the way I can feel this. But I can feel how the money is going to play with play into the politics. It's going to be used as an excuse. Money motivates people, but it's not an input as such. It's not an electric input. It's not a. It it it, it can motivate people in ways that are predictable, and it it money itself is a special kind of motivator, right? And so I have to talk about money, but money's more complicated than the scope of this show. Does that make sense? And so I don't want people making knee-jerk reactions based on something I've said without consulting somebody who knows, be that a Bitcoiner or somebody who's into crypto or, or somebody who's into stocks or somebody who's into all the rest of this. The people who are into the stocks, they're not, I don't think they're looking circumspect. I don't think they're looking all around. They're not looking at everything. They're looking at their little thing and they're saying, well, everything looks fine. Everything looked great here. That's not going to collapse. So you may be led astray by people who are expert, but I don't want people to mistakenly uh, have a knee-jerk reaction and do something that could harm them. That's fundamentally why I say don't listen to me about money. Listen to me about Hello, everyone. Thanks very much for watching. This is just a short version of a longer show. If you'd like to get the whole show, you can go over to CanadaPoly.com and sign up for a subscription. Just look in the drop down tab for shop and donate and look for subscriptions and you'll get immediate access to the full show. Love to see you. Thanks for watching, everybody. Have a wonderful, wonderful.